Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today holds a distinguished place in the world of Indian art. As a distinguished painter himself, as a teacher, a professor, and someone who has played a critical role in the dissemination and appreciation of contemporary Indian art. He's the director of the National Gallery of Modern Art, celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Rajiv Lochin. Uh, how comfortable are you with the prefix professor? You know, not, not something you apply to many artists and painters. To tell you the truth, I love that prefix uh -huh. for a simple reason that uh, it brings to light the two decades that I've put in into achieving that. Mm -hmm. And that I still would like to maintain my academic interests, which I have been involved with all these years, and is which have actually contributed, or which are in the process of contributing to National Gallery of Modern Art, because I actually see National Gallery of Modern Art as a virtual extension of this academic, you know, uh, intervention that I've uh, had, and I see it as a culmination of those ideas in the in the form that they would appear to be. So that's 50 years of the National Gallery and you're sort of seven months or you know a little more than that late in, in, in the celebrations which have only recently uh, unfolded. Uh, why the delay? There's been sort of you know concern and questions about that. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the National Gallery was born in Ma on March 29th. Uh, that was the transition period as far as the governments were concerned and we were advised to celebrate it at a time and therefore I thought that you know whenever we start celebrating it it'll be know, time it'll to celebrate time to celebrate and we can do that for a whole year and that's how I you know, sort of uh, change of government uh, inevitably has involved uh, you know particularly in, 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 in the sort of more intellectual uh, uh, spheres and and organizations um, uh, a, a purging, in a sense, of ideology. What's happened to the National Gallery of Modern Art? Well, to tell you the truth, we've been very lucky in the sense that uh, I've seen the transition in its totality, and uh, uh, both the governments have allowed me, and present governments equally allowing me, to do and envisage the future of an NGMA the way art demands it to be. And I think that's a great, uh, uh, you know, what should I say, I should be thankful to the, both the governments for having done so. So is there sort of uh, an ideological framework for art and what might that be? I mean, what would be a right-wing view of uh, the kind of art that uh, the National Gallery has or, or, or a middle-of-the-road view or a, a left-wing view? National Gallery of Modern Art has one single aim, the best and the most important both in terms of ideologically path-breaking works historically relevant in the context, cultural context, the social context, are the ones that are meant to be because we are the repository of the cultural ethos of the country. Irrespective of ideologies, if they find a place within the framework of the creative endeavor, the creative enterprise that we are uh, supposed to look after and that what we are trying to do, I think, you know, National Gallery of Modern Art stands up and supports that. And I've been very lucky that uh, people associated with me have also shared the same view and given me the kind of support that I wanted. The minute uh, there, there is an institution such as the National Gallery which is funded with public money, and there is always sort of uh, controversy because there is the inherent uh, possibility of uh, patronage uh, controversy is why a particular painter figures and why someone else doesn't and a painting figures and why you know some other painting doesn't and what have you well it's bound to happen but then uh, again if you have a larger vision of life and where anything and everything that ha that is important and relevant can be accommodated not for the sake of being accommodated but selectively <laughs> you know, made part of the mainstream. But this is the question of egos, you know, my painting doesn't get there and yours does and vice versa and so it goes on. So how do you, how do you negotiate that? You, you know, sort of you're a, you're, you're a free bird, you're a free agent, sort of an artist. And how do you go around sort of coping with this kind of stuff? Well, <laughs> 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 that's, a, that's a very, very <laughs> tricky question to answer. Nevertheless, I think it's uh, 
being able to to perceive people's mind and and also time which is more very very relevant and important that one is able to find ways and means of rising above and i think all this so you do come under these kinds of pressures well um, uh, you know these are bound to happen because artists are egocentric people including myself <laughs> and i think it is this ego that drives them to do and create the way they do and um, many of them uh, are able to contain that within themselves and others would like to to extend that to other peripheries well you know i have a very sort of uh, gross sensibility and i go into the national gallery of modern art and and, and you know, I, I don't sort of quite appreciate and, and, and respond to much of uh, what I see. Um, what is sort of the basis? What is a yardstick that you use to decide that this is a good, great painting or a work of art because you don't have just paintings, you have other things too, that needs to be in the National Gallery of Modern Art? Incidentally, I have people who help me do so. Uh, we have it on our committees, uh, important artists, well, who have, uh, as we say, arrived, see, seen the world, and have responded to. You know, I'm sort of art looking historians. to you as as an academic, and you know, and, and say, if I was a student in your class, and, and like I said, a gross sensibility, what would you say to me uh, in in terms of? Well, you know, this is this is what becomes art because it, at, at at a mundane level, you know, everything is art, uh, and and artistic. Uh, in some ways. Yeah. I'm asking sort of for you to define in some ways uh, what would be uh, you know, a, a piece of art, uh, you know, what yardsticks, what terms of reference uh, an, an ordinary, everyday, mundane human being such as me might use uh, to respond to a piece of art. What should well, I be looking uh, for? Uh, art is not about replication of reality. Art is about seeing reality, getting it to its essence and finding via medias and and options of creating a new world, creating a new image, which appeals and is uh, relatable to, to, to something that exists uh, in a different world and in its own, uh, own areas of, uh, uh, and domain. And, and only that becomes art. Mm -hmm. Other only rep remains as mm -hmm. representation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's how mm -hmm. I'd like to define mm -hmm. art to be. It is that creative, uh, you know, element mm -hmm. that actually defines an appropriate usage of the language, whichever language you use, that when, when it juxtaposes itself and s synthesizes itself in the appropriate fashion, that, that creates a work of art which is truly worth its song. You know, the National Gallery of Modern Art started with a very small collection, I think of about 200 odd paintings, and it's today grown to more than 16,000. So what becomes the, the, the aspiration, the role uh, of the National Gallery? A repository of the best of uh, modern art, and, and then what? You know, occasionally you put them up on, on the walls and people come and look at them, and, and, and that's it? Uh, you know, I have a very ambitious plan. Uh, we are truly the repository of the cultural ethos of the country in, in terms of creative endeavors. The collection has indeed grown from 200 to almost 17,000 today. We are building a very large extension to the museum. In Bangalore, is it? In Delhi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just behind, which is 27,000 square meters of new space. So virtually transforming the entire museum into a much more museum-friendly, you know, institution. Mm -hmm. Which, I, which would have facilities and provisions for more interactive programs, exclusive programs for children, uh, documentation center, a research center, proper restoration labs, an academic block, a preview theater where I want to have a whole library of films. So I've in, in other words, I don't want this to remain a gallery, so to say which it is only because of lack of space right what now. What about this initiative in, in, in Bangalore where you're taking uh, uh, a sort of, you know, some of the, 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 uh, uh, the collection down south? Uh, how is that progressing? That too seemed to be for a while mired in controversy and delays. Uh, you see, we have a functional branch in Bangalore, uh, in Bombay, sorry, and we are building one in Bangalore. 
the whole idea is that the presence of National Gallery of Modern Art and with this prestigious collection along with the major exhibitions that we curate either from our collection or the ones that come from other parts of the, of the world as part of the cultural exchange program should be able to, be, to travel, to be able to be showcased in other areas from where people find it difficult to come all the way to Delhi. Mm -hmm. And I think it is with this intention that these regional centers, these are regional branches of the National Gallery of Modern Art, one at the CJ Hall in Bombay, so whenever we curate a major retrospective exhibition or an international exhibition, say Picasso, Delhi hosted it and thereafter it traveled to Bombay. We'll ha we want to add many more centers like that apart from Bangalore, say. In what ways is, is the National Gallery responding to the changes in the very notions of art? Uh, you know, you go to the uh, National Gallery of Modern Art in, say, New York or Paris, and you know, you'll even see, uh, you know, a, a, a can of, of Coke or Pepsi uh, as as a, as a work of art on on display. Uh, so obviously, you know, pushing the boundaries uh, of uh, what is art. And are we still much too traditional and you know stuck with painting and sculpture and things like that? I think we are we are opening up. We have opened up quite. A museum needs a solid collection in its repository to be able to showcase that because most of the time you cannot live on borrowed works. So what are your efforts to get sort of into, in, into the newer forms of art and, and to incorporate them into your collection? Uh, actually we have already committed to ceramics as a new mm -hmm. medium, to installations and new media art. Mm -hmm. In fact my own work is mm -hmm. a kind of a new media intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I believe in is that the infrastructure and the facilities along with the collection needs to be geared up in its proper perspective. So this is a state-of-the-art building with new experimental spaces for the kind of work that works that need to be shown. And we are already targeting people like Anish Kapoor with major exhibitions to be held in India in 2006. We're also, uh, you know, we're also negotiating with the Mexicans to bring in Tamayo. So mm -hmm. here's going to be a big mix of both the so-called conventional forms of art as well as the more experimental ones that we are, you know, and the whole infrastructure and facilities along with provisions for, for all such major events to happen are uh, soon going to be in place. So again, sort of my gross sensibility, help me understand uh, modern art, you know, what a, a, a Swiss knife or uh, you know, the kind of things that I've seen in, in, in the National Galleries of Modern Art elsewhere, uh, how do they happen to be there? You know, I've, I've often asked myself that question. Uh, familiar objects from everyday life, uh, of course, sort of, uh, you know, uh, tend to get a different kind of life when seen uh, on, on display. But I wondered what yardstick, what processes have been gone through in, in, in the curator's mind uh, to choose these everyday objects and display them as works of art? Yeah, I think it's the context that they are either, you know, conceived in terms of and that they are portrayed that actually transforms the identity of the thing and in the relations of which it is, it, it is uh, projected uh, with conceptual concerns. So I think it is this conceptual intervention of a kind that, that transforms the very nature of objects, the way they are and the way they are being presented. And these are, uh, uh, you know, newer experimentation that has happened in the West and is slowly creeping into India. Some of our very young and talented artists are doing exceedingly well and showing, uh, you know, their works elsewhere in the world. And I think it's very important that soon uh, National Gallery of Modern Art would also, we've already actually ac started acquiring many of these. So you moved beyond the sort of, you, you don't have to be this great veteran and this great artist in the classical sense to get into the National Gallery. You can be someone young, dynamic, innovative, and, and not yet necessarily arrived uh, to find a place there. Wherever we see the process of arrival, you know, it, and path breaking, experiment. Ah, what is it to arrive? <laughs> what, <laughs> what is this process of arrival? What do you look for? That a lot of people begin to say this guy is wonderful? Or do you go out and use your personal instinct and that of your committee? Both. Mm -hmm. In fact, both. 
It's like saying that, you know, you observe the creative processes of a particular artist, the way he has evolved, the way he is evolving, and, you know, the kind of interjections that are getting associated with, mm -hmm. with his work, and the kind of dimensions that they are taking, and then you put your finger onto, well, that's the period, that's the work that we are interested in, and try and, you know, bring that into the main. Despite the risks of being wrong. And, 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 and somebody turning to you uh, and saying that, look, you, you've been wasting public money. Well, that's always happened. How important and, and, and what, what, what role does public money play in the National Gallery? And is that a constraint in, in terms of your ability to acquire paintings and, 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 and works of art? Well, uh, it may be a very personal observation, but I have never felt the crunch as far as financial aspects are concerned. And how do you acquire works of art for your collection? Do you pay for them or is, ju is it just an honor to be in the National Gallery and so uh, uh, an artist will give it to you? Both, uh, both roles are open. We scout, look out, advertise, and for a whole year keep tracking artists and their exhibitions and cull out the ones that we consider worthy of being part of the... And then do you pay market rates? Uh, well, uh, we don't, <laughs> don't uh, you know, certainly do pay, pay reasonable rates, which are, and artists are, are ready to oblige, because I think they understand that these works are going into the, one of the most prestigious collections of the country. But it also does not stop us from letting people bequeath their collections or you know, you know, wherever we see that there is a possibility of this nature, we have opened our doors to that. And in the, in the next couple of years, you would see a lot of work in this direction. In fact, Hussain Saab was here, and I, I shared with him that, you know, this, this delight of having a new museum by, by the year 2006. So he's given you some paintings to well, auction. He's agreed to, he has agreed <laughs> to, he has agreed to do a new work for us. And the options are open, whether someone would acquire it and bequeath it to the National Gallery of Modern Art, or he shall donate it. So National Gallery of Modern Art's doors are, abs are, are open to collaborations. We collaborate with major galleries, major museums. We are open to collaborate. We even collaborate with hotels for hos as ho hos hospitality partners whenever we have our international exhibitions or retrospectives. Because I think it's about celebrating art in whichever fashion we do by uni unifying our efforts from all the directions rather than be remaining an isolated uh, institution which has little relationship w with, with people that it belongs to. Uh, you started off um, uh, you know, studying in Baroda and, and uh, photography was a very early and enduring influence uh, in your work photorealism uh, has been sort of a, a, a hallmark, trademark uh, of your work. What is the relationship uh, between that kind of reality that you capture on a photograph and then embellish and something that comes from the inner recesses of your imagination and someone just creates a canvas? That seems sort of in, in some ways a, a more romantic notion of art uh, rather than something grounded in, in, in the reality of a photograph. What drew you to this realism? I'd like to share that to me it is a more contemplative nature, mm -hmm. you know, rather than. Uh, you see, mm, the moment has always interested me because uh, the moment is pregnant with surprises. It's the perceptive uh, background in which we live and react to a particular situation that is so instantaneous that there is no way to actually either sketch it or record it. So my work has those psychological, you know, uh, interventions of the. So kind. in a sense, there is a relationship. The starting point is the moment of the the, the the camera shutter, and frequently it's an accident to to get the moment, isn't it? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> I would say it the other way around. Uh -huh. That uh, normally you start with a blank canvas and that and arrive at your image. In my case, I start from a concrete reality and push that concrete reality to arrive at my moment. The only and the most uh, interesting and fascinating appropriate tool over the years that I could find was the camera that I go around with all the time, or most of the time. 
I am still carrying my camera bag without the camera. Uh, it's like saying that you know you observe that moment over given you know different uh, times of the day, different states of mind, and then a particular moment arrives. You know when you say, ah, that's it. So how long does it take you to grab the camera and click? No, I mean you know you you're <laughs> there. You you know you're you're planning. You're contemplating all the time. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not interested in that in that flickering moment alone. I'm more interested in the ambience of the image because these photographs are like my notes, which need to again brew to transport them to that realm of personal phantasm that I have been that is lurking or sur surging in my own inner mind. Mm -hmm. That is why I use the word more con contemplative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I uh, would utilize that physicality of the photographic image to to recreate that image and push it to a reality on the canvas until I realized that does it matter where you buy your chicken from? <laughs> what matters <laughs> it? What is it that you do to it? A certain kind of an inner revelation and <laughs> said, okay, that's the end of the canvas. That goes. <laughs> what? Why can't I do, why shouldn't I do what I want to do over and uh, overcome these barriers of material <laughs> and arrive and therefore this intervention of of trying to work on the photographic surface using all kinds of things from sprays to acids to scratching to scribbling to and crayon transporting to crayon yes. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the la layering the undercoats the this thing hmm? and even juxtapose images or else uh, try and see how the duality of the image coexists so these are newer, you know. In uh, some ways that, you know, you've been doing this for a very long time and it sort of has anticipated a lot of uh, modern contemporary electronic uh, art uh, where an image is now sort of, uh, you know, y y you're combining sort of, uh, you're applying the classical uh, on, on, on the modern on in the a modern, sense. Yeah. And I think that now you have sort of, uh, uh, the modern is being manipulated purely electronically. Uh, and, 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 and not using traditional devices. Are you sort of moving into, into those areas of experimentation or do you still feel that one foot in the classical is, is, is crucial? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, I've just recently bought my digital camera. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> After a great deal uh -huh. of uh, rethinking uh -huh. because uh, I think it's important to keep. But nevertheless, I still feel more comfortable. Why? Because the kind of uh, uh, clarity of purpose and material that I still can get through conventional means is still not close as far as the digital is concerned. Director of the National Gallery of Modern Art, how do you get time to sort of pursue your own work uh, uh, as a painter? And, and, and what do you feel is your primary identity? Your painter, teacher, uh, a babu? <laughs> well, uh, Did you cringe when I called you a babu? <laughs> no, in, in fact, I always say I don't want to become one. <laughs> and I always also say I will not become one. <laughs> you said it rightly. In fact, most of my work uh, does involve a great deal of of that, uh -huh. <laughs> whatever you call it. <laughs> but you will not use that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somehow. <laughs> uh, but then, yes, I've always been interested in diverse kind of things. I think my interests are still, you know, educational and academic. And that's how I see the museum to be. That's why I use the word. I envisage this to be a kind of a research center involved in, in researching trends and, you know, uh, and, and and contemporary art, modern in art, still needs to be worked at and you know written about. Uh, my w own work certainly has taken a back seat for a while, but then these are inner compulsions that push you to drive and drive you to 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 you know create and do what you actually long to. And uh, I have found out ways and means of doing that. I invariably take four or five days off whenever I can. <laughs> to go into art workshops. And you'd be surprised, uh, October, I was there, I shot 28 films. And I'm ready with a whole sequence of about 60 works. Mm -hmm. I often get up at five in the morning and paint until nine and get to office by 10 o'clock. And become a babu, I'm sorry to push that. Mm -hmm. And so what epitaph is the former director 16 years later of the National Gallery? Well, I, uh, let me uh, share with you frankly that I don't uh, look at the years so much as the kind of work that I've undertaken for myself. 
And I'm happy to share with you that uh, uh, some of the, the most path-breaking uh, you know, uh, decisions uh, have not only been taken, have been executed during my, my What would you want people to say about you at the end of it? Yes, I want to, at the end of it, go back realizing that, yes, National Gallery of Modern Art is truly an international institution worthy and comparable to any other international museum of modern art. And what would you have people say about Rajiv Lochan, the artist? I think I'll try and continue my creative activity alongside. Once the basic infrastructure in the museum is in its place, I think I'll ha find more time to be equally involved with my own creative pursuits as I am presently. Uh, you know, involved. So a great them. artist who created a great institution. Rajiv Lochan, thank you very much. This has been a great Thank place. you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Lovely. It's <laughs> always lovely talking to you. Good luck. Thanks.